All right. Well, good morning to you. We are continuing a study of redemption, following the story of redemption. We started with Adam and Eve, and we've been walking through uh, the flood, and now we've come up into the to the patriarchal time. We've been with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Today we're going to spend a lot of our time with Jacob, and uh, next week we will pick up Joseph and follow him as he goes down to Egypt uh, as we follow this story of redemption as it goes. We're not going verse by verse. Normally when the people who listen to me preach the most know that I'm a verse by verse preacher. We just get someplace and, and take off. But this is a story by story sort of series. And it will be until the Lord uh, says you've had enough of that. Go somewhere else. But we're going to be today in the 35th chapter of Genesis is pretty much where we'll be. And we're going to even jump around in the end. So uh, again, I apologize because this will be a different way of following or learning a, a, a Bible story. Well, let me start by saying to you that I'm convinced that it's time for our nation, it's time for us, it's time for our families uh, to get back to the Lord. We have tried everything. We've tried relativism. We've tried political political correctness. We've uh, we've kind of gone off on on uh, scientific medical things and new breakthroughs and all that. And let me tell you something, folks. None of that's going to save us. The only thing that's going to save us is Jesus. And the only thing that can, can get your heart right, your family right, your life right, and our nation right is to go back to Him. And uh, you can say amen if you want to or just be quiet and miss a blessing. It's up to you. <clears throat> but I believe we are, we must take our nation back. Otherwise, we're in a terminal failure situation. I believe that. Now, I, while I'm on that subject, let me say I don't, I follow the presidential elections. I really do. And I have great interest there. And uh, I've already picked out my favorite. But uh, I will tell you, I don't think that it matters who we put in the in the office. If we, the grassroots people, we don't get our hearts right with the Lord, it, it won't matter. Because Washington only reflects our morality and our wishes. In other words, we get who we deserve. Amen. Yeah. You understand? Amen. So the change has to start here in us. It's just the way I feel about that. Now, we're going to follow Jacob today a little bit. And he's been through a meat grinder. I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about it. Jacob's had a, a, a messed up life, a difficult life. He was born, uh, his name means heel grabber. He's a con man. He was born, he tricked his brother out of stuff two times. He's uh, he. he He's a slick, slimy sort of guy. Uh, his brother Esau was a mountain man. Harry, you know, you can you, we can identify more with Esau than most farmer country guys can identify more with Esau than we can identify with Jacob. But Jacob was the con, the, the con man. And so we're going to just leave it at that. He'd been through a lot. And this old Jacob now was, he had uh, met God. He'd been, he had found the Lord at Bethel. But then he'd been through a lot of things. And now, after today, we're going to follow him through that dark time, and he's going to meet God again, and God's going to send him back to Bethel. So we're going to refer to Bethel. When I say it today, I'm saying Jacob has a revival. He goes back to the Lord. He comes back to his roots. He goes back to old-time religion, as it were, as opposed to uh, his own way and his own arrogance and his own pride. It's time. I think it might be time for you to go back to Bethel. I think it, I know it's time for our families to strength, be strengthened by a renewed commitment to living by God's rule and by God's laws. It's time for that old time religion. Let me say to you, friends, that I don't think any shortcut. There is, there are no shortcuts here. We, we, there is no workarounds. You simply must go back. To your original faith. You've got to get back to where we used to be. <clears throat> We're going to look today again at Jacob and Esau. Uh, Jacob has been off in Padanaram, which is Mesopotamia. <clears throat> Anytime we talk about this Mesopotamia and Padanaram, this, these are, this is the place where Abraham came from. It's back up to Abraham's people. And so Abraham left his father, you know, Terah and, and, and Haran there, and they came on around, and, and then they came down to Jerusalem. Well, every time Abraham and Isaac, whenever they wanted wives for their children, they'd send them back to Padanaram or to 
uh, Mesopotamia, back to get back to the original family. So they wanted to, to this God was putting this family together. We more know we know them today as the Jewish nation, and so they God kept putting them back together. So Jacob and Esau, Jacob's coming back and from Padanaram. He's got a wife. His life is is beginning to make sense for him. He's growing in. He's getting mature. He's growing up, and he wants to to get back to the Lord. He, he wants to get back with his brother. Their relationship has been strained for years and they and he wants to renew that with his brother and, and this is all beginning to happen and, and it does happen and they then he gets on with his life. So he's now on his way back to Bethel. But I want you to notice he has to go through enemy territory to get back to Bethel. Please, if I, that's a sermon in itself. When you want to get back to the Lord, the devil doesn't want you to. Let's just be honest. But he's going to put things in your way. He's going to do what he can to restrict your journey and your return to the Lord. I believe, and I want to just sort of give you a little insight that I've been able to gather together through the recent years of study. I believe that, that Satan realized, Lucifer the devil, realized that God was working in this family. He was going to work through Abraham, through Isaac through Jacob. And he was going to work in a particular area, Jerusalem area, called the Promised Land. By the way, where they lived in Bethel is about seven miles north of Jerusalem. So it's, you get the idea where Abraham landed was real close to, to that area. So the devil, and this is where I, I want you to get this. This is kind of a, an eye-opener for you and I want you to see it. The devil knew somehow he figured out what God was doing. He He's smart. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, he's powerful, more powerful than we can imagine. He figured out what God was going to do, and he put in the way all of this stuff that, that we've been talking about in Genesis, coming through the Sodom and Gomorrah stuff, the perversion, the sexual perversion. He put this idolatrous Canaanite people there in the way to try to trick, try not try to trick, but try to pull Jewish people into this faith, this horrible idolatrous faith of child sacrifice and human sacrifice and on and on. And, and so the devil put all of that in the way so that the patriarchs would have to walk through that to get to the, to the redemption that we, we love and enjoy so much today. So back in Mesopotamia, they, they believed in Jehovah God. They did. Terah and, and all the, the Nahor and Laban and all the people that we, we know that is in Abraham's family that didn't come into the promised land, they are also believers in Jehovah God. But I want to teach you a new word today. And the word is henotheism. They were henotheists, which means they worshipped Jehovah God, but they also worshipped other gods. In other words, they had Jehovah was the, the God of... They understood who He was. They worshipped Him as King of Kings, Creator of Heaven and Earth, you know, the whole deal. But they also had other gods that they went to from time to time. And I find modern ears, when I tell this story, modern ears will always say, well, those no good people, those people of low faith, why would they do that? Hey, be careful. Be careful before you start throwing stones. Because i got a feeling a lot of you live in glass houses. And you believe God is God, and you worship Him as the high God, but you also hold on to some other stuff that could be called idolat idolatrous or idols. See, I think that we're, we're more like them than we like to think sometimes. And I'm going to talk, I'll, I'll flesh that out just a little bit later in the sermon when we get to it. Okay, let's, let's go and, and, and let me refresh your memory. Do you remember in the Bible stories when Jacob and Rachel and Leah ran out in the night from Laban. They left Laban's home. Some of you remember this. Uh, up in Mesopotamia, Padanaram. They left there in the night because Laban had added on years of work for, for Jacob and hadn't played fair with him. Uh, nobody seemed to play fair with Jacob because maybe he didn't play fair with others. But they left in the middle of the night. And here's a little tidbit. Rachel and Leah left, but they took the household idols with them. Do you remember that? They took Laban's idols. Remember, Laban believed in God, but he also had idols around, little idolaters, little idol figurines or whatever that they put on the mantle and they worshipped. I don't know what it was like, but you figure it out. So they left, they took with them. Now, 
just I just want to throw that into the story to flavor it because I want you to see later where this stuff comes from. Now, I want you to meet another person, another lady. This is not one you hear about very often. Her name is Dinah. Have you heard of Dinah? Dinah's in the kitchen with... <laughs> so someone's in the kitchen with... Dinah. <laughs> but this, this, is, uh, one of the, this is one of the children of Israel. She is, one of the, she is a, the only daughter that we have mentioned of the twelve sons of Jacob or Israel. She's the one. Okay, her name is Dinah. Dinah became a young woman, grew up and uh, wanted to... I, I think this is a, a euphemistic way of saying she was looking for a husband. She began to start looking around. She, the Bible says she wanted to go see her friends or whatever. You can read it in, in your translations. And so while she was out looking around, uh, look, I, probably looking for a husband, she was kidnapped and raped by a tribe of Canaanites. <clears throat> Of these evil people, they they kidnapped her and they raped her. One of the one of the young men fell in love with her and he raped her. Now, Jacob finds out about it, and Jacob, remember, he's a pretty sly dude, right? He thinks things out, so he thought, okay, let's go up there and talk to him. Let's let us let us get her back. So they go, no, you can't have her back. Sorry, we're going to keep her. And he said, okay, you can have her, but we're Jewish and we believe in circumcision. So, if you keep Dinah here, you'll have to circumcise all the males in your tribe. Okay. They said, well, <laughs> that's a big sacrifice. You know? And that probably is going to hurt pretty bad. But that's how it's going to be. Jacob said, if you're going to have if Dinah stays, all of the males in this, this tribe have to be circumcised. So, they set up a day. They had the, they called him a circumciser. I don't know what they called him. But they circumcised all the men in that tribe. And how many of you know what happens on the third day after surgery? Is that about the worst day that you have? Well, guess what Jacob did on the third day after surgery? He attacked the Canaanite tribe and killed them and rescued Dinah. He had planned it all the time, see. He'd been figuring out how to do this. So on the third day after surgery, he sent in his his black ops and they took them all out. All right. That's just something that you need to fold into this story because it's a big part of it. Well, word of the massacre spread and so Jacob's people uh, became infamous and feared. People were afraid of them because of what they did. But he was in trouble with all the natives around that area. Now, what happens to... Jacob is so important for you and for me because every time Jacob gets into trouble, God calls him back to Bethel. It happened, it's happened several times in our story. And today is the same thing. After Jacob got into trouble with killing these Shechemites or these Canaanites, Canaanites uh, after he killed them, he was in trouble with everybody else and war was going to break out. God called him back to Bethel. And Jacob then goes back to Bethel and meets his God and, and <clears throat> gets forgiveness and, and he prays and is, re is restored uh, to his rightful self. So every time Jacob obeys, arranges an altar, and pours out to God a sacrifice. Now here, here is the sermon today in one sentence. When you hit bottom, go back to where you met God and start over. Alright? Th that's what I'm trying to say today. There is a chance for you to start over. I know there's in this room this morning a, a church of this size. There are people here who are struggling with something. Uh, drugs, sex, uh, attitudes, you know, uh, the law maybe. I, you, medical. You're struggling with things and you are close to the bottom and you, you feel like you failed. Let me tell you, what's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? Here it is. A Christian will get up and go back to God. A, a, a lost person will just wallow in his sin. So if you're here today and you know the Lord and you're in trouble, get up and go back to Bethel. Go back to where you met God and start over. And then the question comes out immediately, okay, how then do I find my way home to God? How do I do that? How do I get up from where I am in this mess I've made in my life? How do I get up and, I, and go back to God? All right, let's get into Genesis 35 and see if God will give us any answers to that vital question that we all need to know. How do I get back to God? Chapter 35, verse 2. Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods 
you have with you. All right? Where did they get the foreign gods? They brought them from Laban. They stole them from old man Laban's house. So Jacob said, get rid of them. And then he says, and purify yourselves and change your clothes. What's going on here? Jacob is getting ready to spiritually renew his family. So the first thing he says, get rid of your idols. Clean up. Take a bath. Put on new clothes. Purify yourself. And then come and let's go back to Bethel. In other words, do everything you can to change your heart, your life, your, everything about you, but get ready for God to restore and redeem and forgive. See, God's not going to force forgiveness on you. He won't come and knock you down with redemption. You have to want it. You have to, you know, you have, your heart has to desire it. He won't force it on you. So that's what He was saying to them to do, for them to do. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, a phrase. Certainly not original with me. But I wish it were something. I wish I had said something like this. But it is so profound. But I'm going to. You may even want to write this down. I, and I know it has changed my life. Here it is. Here is the phrase. What we do is what we believe. Everything else is just religious talk. Now let that soak in a minute. What we do is what we believe. In other words, look at your life and what are you doing? Well, what are you doing with your life? Are you? Are you living in sin? Are you, uh, are you being faithful to your devotional life with the Lord? Are you staying close to God? Close to God, or are you away? Are you henotheistic? Are you away from God? And where are you? Because what you do is what you believe. So the Bible says, "Out of the heart flows the intent of a man, and the intent of a man flows out of his mouth." In other words, the heart is first. What's in your heart? What what do you do? Because everything else is just religious talk. You can talk a big ball game. You can talk big Christianity. But if you don't walk it, then what you do is what you believe. And the rest is just, yeah, 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 yeah. You understand? All right. Anything you substitute for God is an idol. Anything you substitute or put in the place of God is an idol. It gets in your way. It, it be, you become idolatrous if there's something in your way. The Ten Commandments, what do they start out with? Thou shalt have no other God before me. Why, does it, why is that so priority? Because you can't have other gods before the Jehovah God and your life ever amount to anything. You cannot have Him, any other thing in the way. I, I, I think there are a lot of modern God substitutes. <clears throat> I'm going to mention a few of them. Uh, categories are self. I think that's the biggest one. Our pride, our ego, a pleasure, our own self. Friends, have you noticed that our nation has become a nation of I, me, and mine, self? We've elevated self to Godhood. Well, if it feels good, just do it. If you get pregnant, you don't have a baby, just kill it. If you wanna, you know, if you wanna feel good, you're not, you're tired of the way you look, just get drunk or have get some drugs and stay hot. You know, we are a culture of just do what feels right and feels good. We're self, we elevate itself to Godhead, we Godness, and we've turned that into an idol. <clears throat> Moses was <clears throat> somewhat like that. He had a rod that God had given him. This is there's a whole other sermon here, but I'll just bring it for just an illustration. But, God, but Moses had a rod in his hand. And with the rod, you remember, he parted the Red Sea and he did all this stuff. There was a time when God said to Moses, Moses, throw the rod down. <clears throat> throw it down. And I think there's a whole lot in that. You're depending too much on that rod, Moses. It's not the rod, it's me. But Moses had it a little... Do I want to say another little God? I mean, yeah, I think so. God said, throw it down. And what did it turn into? A snake. Well, there's a story right there too. But And then the, the, then God said to Moses, okay, now Moses, pick it up. And I could just hear Moses thinking, God, you haven't been here in a long time, have you? I mean, you, you don't know how snakes work, do you? Something. I mean, golly, uh, you don't pick up a snake by the tail. What is wrong? And God said, pick it up, Moses. And Moses says, okay. And he picked it up and turned back into his rod. Okay. He, but there's sometimes you got to throw your rod down. Sometimes you got to throw your religion down. Some, because it could be an idol. Sometimes you can throw you got to throw your church down because your church can be an idol. You know, people. There's a lot of people have churchianity and don't have Christianity. You can. And let me tell you something. Don't go to heaven and tell God you went to Cowboy Church. No, because that won't impress him at all. 
No, he don't care where you went to church. He wants to know what's, what's in your heart. How did you do? How did you do? Because what you do is what you believe. Everything else just talk. Okay. Well, there's a difference here. On Calvary, we saw the real thing. Let me tell you about sacrifice for just a moment. Or an altar. Let's talk about it. When, when uh, Jacob went back to Bethel, he built an altar. What is an altar? Do you matter know what an altar is? Let's go back to the original, the original use of the word altar. What did they do on altars? They kill things on altars. Now today in our churches, you know, well, we don't have it here, but in some churches you have a prayer benches or altars. You go, you know, the front of the church is an altar. And we've, we've, uh, harm, we've softened it. We've made it beautiful and pretty. An altar is where things die. Where the blood comes out of things. You with me? Okay, so when Jacob went back to Bethel and built an altar, God was saying, Jacob, I probably want you on that altar more than anything else. Uh, the story I heard years ago about a missionary was preaching a revival in the most remotest place in Africa you could imagine. There was a man who came to the revival service. And when he got there, he came at the invitation and he walked down the aisle as others were coming, doing to give themselves to the Lord. But when this native came, he had on nothing but a loincloth. Just one, just a loincloth. No backpack, no staff, no anything. He walked down the altar at the invitation, got up on the communion table, crossed his legs, and said, I give myself to Jesus. I have nothing else to give him. Wow. What are you giving to the Lord? 10% of your income? No, God, God wants more. all of you. He want, that's the only kind of altar and sacrifice He accepts. Now, have you done that? Where are you in this journey? Or are you keeping some of yourself back for other things? Well, if you do, that becomes a God. A substitute God. And you and I are a hymnotheist. Well, so first of all, <clears throat> we've got to make sure we evaluate everything we believe and get rid of everything but Jesus. Get back to basics. Evaluate what you believe and get rid of everything that's in the way. Get back to Him. Second thing, you need to make a life-altering commitment. A life-changing commitment. Read verse 6 with me, please. <clears throat> Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. There he, verse 7, There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, because it was there that God revealed Himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to do something. If you're going to come, if you're going to follow Jesus, you need to come out of your closet. Some of you are closet Christians. Where you work, nobody knows it. You're, you're a believer. You really are. But nobody knows it. You don't let anybody know it. You're quiet about it. Shh, just don't talk about that. I don't want to make anybody mad. Politically correct, I can't, I can't do that. Listen to me. You've got to come out of your closet for Jesus. You see, you, can, you can't deny Him. He said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father which is in heaven. We can't be deniers, folks. You're going to have to come out of your closet. So if you're trying to be a Christian on Sunday and not on the rest of the week, you're going to have to make a, a commitment to the Lord that's life-changing and life-altering. Build an altar and crawl up on it and die there. Die to self and live to the Lord. When you come, you must purify yourself by complete repentance, change your clothes, or at least be willing to make changes, and then pour your life out on the altar. Well, if you're serious about starting over, you need to get right with God. That's the only way you're going to get right back to, to being serious with Him. And, I mean, and back on, in, in line with Him is to build an altar. And then the third thing, and I close with this, is wait for God. Then wait for God to make a way for you to live a new life. <clears throat> Whenever you've come to the Lord, you're new, you're fresh, you're clean, you've repented, then you've given yourself into the Lord's hand. Then folks, take your, as we say, take your stinking hands off of it and let God do what He wants to do with you. We still want to tell God how to do everything. Let me say something. God is God and you're not. His job description is different than your job description. Your job description is love God and love each other. God's job description is to do everything else. Okay. Don't confuse your job descriptions. 
climb on the altar, give yourself to the Lord, and then let Him give you a new life. Now here's what happened. First, well, let's read verse 5. Go back to verse 5. Then they set out. This is the part I left out. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell on all the towns around them, so that no one pursued them. Do you see what happened here? When Jacob got his heart right with the Lord, God put the fear in, of him in his all of his neighbors. God made a way for him. God knocked down his uh, uh, people that were opposing him and made a way for him to go. So God will bless you, and 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 He will take care of you. Let me say quickly. I need to say this. That just because you get saved doesn't mean you'll never have any more problems. Uh, we do not check out rose-colored glasses on, at the baptismal service. In other words, life is still going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. You're going to have some things to overcome. You're going to have to grow. But that's how you grow in the Lord. That's how you mature in the Lord. So where God guides, He provides. Just stay with Him. And like a big football player that that's running a block or running a block for you, when he knocks a hole in the line, you just go right through with him. Amen. Yeah. All right. If you want to go back to the Lord, start, and He'll make a way. Now I'm going to close it with this thought: When Jacob returned to Bethel, when he got back to Bethel, his life changed. Everything about him changed. Let's read it in verse ten. Jump down to verse ten. After Jacob returned from Padanaram, Mesopotamia, where Abraham's people were, God appeared to him again and blessed him. Verse 10. God said to him, Your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. What does Israel mean? Isha is the uh, Chaldean and ancient Hebraic word for prince. He's an Isha. He's a prince. Ael is God, God's prince. You're a prince with God. What was he? What was Jacob? Heel grabber, con man. Now his name's changed. See, when you come to Jesus and He does such a radical change in your life, folks, you need a new name to, to express who you really are. You get changed. You live different. You think different. You, you practice your life you, differently. Go back to Bethel. Bethel. And you'll find God waiting there for you. And He may even have a new name for you because He's going to change you so radically. Are you ready to go back to Bethel? Amen. You ready to go back to Bethel? Amen. Raise your hand this morning and say, I need to go back to Bethel. I need to go back to Bethel. I've been, I've been struggling around here and slopping around with my life and I need to go back to Bethel. Jesus, I want to pray for these.